Okay, that was weird. <laughs> I don't think you guys like chaparral. In fact, I threw an extra slide in. Because <laughs> I thought it was a requirement to at least show some of these, but nobody showed the skunky monkey flower, so. All right, real, real data now. Seed banks are extremely diverse. You've seen a little bit of examples of that today. And they're classified into different types. You've heard people say transient versus persistent seed bank. But I want you to realize there's huge variation within um, all of those types. So I'm hoping to walk you through a few things just so that you feel uh, like you know everything. If you go to a nice, beautiful chaparral site, this is what it looks like. But if you want it to look like that, with all those annuals and um, seedlings coming up, you need a particular kind of process. And that's a lot of fun in this case. I have to look at it for a little bit before I go on. Chaparral seed banks are extremely diverse. There's a lot of transient seed banks, and that's just seeds that don't last for more than 12 months. Um, mostly they're the woody perennials, like uh, Quercus and Heromeles, and Prunus, Geria, Frangula, other genera whose names have changed, so I can't remember anymore. These things basically germinate in the shade of old, uh, old growth chaparral. They need moist conditions, uh, they have thin leaves, and they can tolerate shade, and that's how they get established. On the other hand, the persistent soil seed banks, which are mostly the dominant three genera, Adnostoma, Ceanothus, and Archistaphylus, uh, with many subsurtestants and many, many annuals. All of these germinate in open post-fire environments, so very high light, high nutrients, uh, very different kind of conditions. So the fire response species um, end up in a very different kind of uh, seedling establishment environment. So just to remind you of what these things look like, transient seed bank species, and some of the persistent seed bank species. These are some of the annuals that come up, but the list you realize, you realize is uh, 60 or 70 different annual species. Right? Rare ones. And what I'll focus on today, the persistent seed banks of some of the woody shrubs. So far, what we've been looking at in the case studies of the three talks ahead of me are basically what you can think of as bet hedging uh, seed banks. And I'm going to be focusing more on uh, mass effects uh, or patch dynamic seed banks, however you want to call them. They don't really have good names. Uh, bet hedging just means that there's a, the plants have been selected to reduce temporal variation in their fitness. Um, but that might lower the potential for any particular year's growth rates. And these guys basically respond to some kind of environmental cue, like a disturbance, and everything germinates rapidly, basically overwhelming uh, anything that's there. So to show what this looks like graphically, this is one year's uh, seed bank. And if you imagine this uh, y-axis as the percentage of the entire seed crop, uh, some little portion of it is non-dormant, and some portion of it is dormant. And the shifts of those different proportions really determines what the persistent fraction of the seed bank is going to look like. So if most of the seeds are, are transient, then the, the persistent seed bank is going to be rather small. If the proportion of uh, dormant seed is, is large, then the persistent uh, piece will be really large quickly. So it'll look something like this, because through time, each year's cohort will be added to it. A fraction will germinate. But you'll eventually build up, if every year is identical, which they never are, but this is a nice theory, uh, you end up at an equilibrium where your seed bank is uh, fairly large and fairly constant. Mass effects, on the other hand, the seeds come out, they're completely dormant, and they require some kind of disturbance event to cue them. And once they have that cue, then they all uh, take off. And if nothing happens, then this kind of seed bank should infinitely increase in density through time. One particular species, Adenostoma fasciculatum, um, has beautiful persistent seeds. Uh, one picture didn't come up, so I'm freaking out a little bit about it. <laughs> 
I'll go back to that point later. Ceanothus has a, a different kind of seed dormancy. They basically require a heat pulse to, there's a small weak area of the seed coat, and once a heat pulse gets it, uh, they can uh, take water up and germinate. Archistaphilus has a huge diversity as well, but their seeds are physiologically dormant and they require chemicals from smoke and a ton of other uh, conditions that we haven't really figured out. But these three have all persistent seed banks, but the queuing for them is really different. So here it's just a heat pulse, here it's a, a physiological dormancy that has to be broken. Uh, Chemise actually has three different kinds of seeds that it produces. A tiny fraction that germinate readily, so a, a tiny transient fraction. A fraction that's a little bit larger that will respond to heat, and then another fraction that will respond to chemicals. So it's a, a much more complex system. Um, all of them, though, do respond to this particular process. And their seed banks have been selected in the uh, context of the long-term farm regime. So here are the, what the seeds look like, just to remind you that if we scale them, um, the smaller seeds should have much larger seed banks. That's basically the theory of, of uh, seed banks. Uh, for example, the Camasonia has massively huge seed banks, and those little tiny seeds are smaller than the, the soil particles, and it's easy for them to incorporate in the soil. You can see these are much larger. And if we put them at the very same scale, the chemise is the uh, smallest of all of them. And so in terms of seed bank sizes, seed, uh, Chemise should have the largest seed banks, followed by Ceanothus, followed by uh, the Archistaphilus species. And if you look at seed production per year, they're all over the place. Uh, Adenosoma can produce tons of seeds in most years. Uh, we put 60,000 up there, but it actually can be probably 100 or 200,000, who knows? It's really hard to count those. Archistaphilus uh, fluctuates from nothing to 10 or 20,000. Uh, Ceanothus can have bad years too, but good years, 20 or 30,000 seeds per meter square. So these things vary all over the place, but when you recall that the seeds are persistent, that means they're just adding seed every year to a, a seed bank with no loss of seed, at least in germination. Here's though what the seed banks look like. So Chemise by far has the largest seed banks. Uh, on the other hand, it's a fraction of their yearly seed production. So even though this is the persistent seed bank, it's a pretty small proportion of what's been produced. And it does uh, respond like that theory. Um, one study in San Diego County found that if you look at three different age classes of Chumis uh, stands, the seed banks get larger through time. Okay. Um, Archistaphilus has a pretty large seed bank, but the, the anomaly in Ceanothus was a very small seed bank. And I'm going to focus on uh, briefly what I think is going on with these and then mostly uh, look at Archistaphilus at the end. But here's what's going on. It's really the seed predators are having a good time. If you were to walk into Chaparral, which probably none of you bothered to do, you wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't see any animals. They all disappear. Most of them come out at night, but it's a huge and rich animal community. And I, I freaked out when I started putting uh, trail cameras out there and you start seeing everything that's out there. And it's, a, it's a super rich uh, system. And there's a lot of predators of these animals as well, which modifies their behavior a lot. Uh, a lot of bobcats, a lot of foxes, so it's a very interesting system. I've only seen one rattlesnake, so that's okay. Let's focus on that seed bank anomaly. Ceanothus and, and Adenosoma basically behave as they're supposed to, and that just means that through time their seed banks get larger. Uh, one just happens to have tons more seed than the other. Ceanothus is very tiny seed banks. Um, so what's really going on is that seed predators are consuming most of those uh, seeds. And Archistaphilus has an anomalously larger seed banks than it's supposed to. So that's what we'll focus on. The hint for the Archistaphilus, and I'll get to that later, is that Chemis has a lot of akenes that it produces that are hollow. And we don't know if that's uh, something that's been selected, if weevils do that, or if they just didn't get pollinated, but they still form the akene. And rodents are surprisingly sophisticated. They can pick up a seed and go, oh, this one's empty, uh, this one's full, and they'll eat the full one. But if they pick up too many of those empty ones, then they move on to someplace else because the well, bobcats are walking around. So let's look at uh, chemise for a second. Um, 
One of my students is uh, collecting seed rain on Mount Diablo right now, and these are, we didn't quite get the flats out there at the beginning, but almost. Uh, so in August, and we only have data through November 25th, but this is seed rain, and it's still going. So we've got uh, over six months of seed rain that's continuously coming down off these plants, and they're continuing to come down. And so what you're really seeing is that the animal population, some of them are resident, but a lot of the animals are migratory. Um, the, uh, some of the birds have come and have already gone from the system. So this has a, a really different way of, of dealing with the world. Uh, this is what the seed accumulation looks like so far. 60,000 per meter square this year and counting. What we've seen in the trail cameras is a variety of uh, granivorous or omnivorous birds. Um, some rodents, mostly really tiny paramiscus, which we suspect is manipulated. Um, and even caught ants walking around in the uh, traps. In Southern California, harvester ants love shimmy seeds. So we suspect that that's one thing that's going on. High levels of seed predation, but even so, the seed bank is continuing to increase. Um, the plant does produce a large proportion of empty achenes, and this might increase animal handling time and animals freak out if they're just sitting around in one place too long. So that might be an important reason why uh, the seed banks are large. Um, and the most interesting thing is they've been extending seed dispersal over a huge uh, time period. And I think that is uh, uh, one way to get past some groups of, of seed predators to keep, keep creating that seed bank. So if we switch to a different genus for a minute, this is a nitrogen fixing genus. They have explosive fruit. And the seeds are almost all filled that you get. Uh, they do have weevils that attack them, but um, the seeds are high in nitrogen and proteins, and so they're extremely beloved by animals. Uh, we found mostly uh, brown toeys and pocket mice are the main predators of this, or other toeys. Uh, but there are a lot of rodents and a lot of other birds that go for them. And you get crazy things like this. So here's the seed bank size. The fruits mature, and after dispersal, you have huge seed banks. Uh, then 93% loss before the next year's fruit. So that's all uh, bird and uh, rodent predation. Lots of different animals. So slightly larger seed, almost always filled, uh, very high seed predation, but nonetheless the seed banks are more than large enough uh, to regenerate the population. Right? So the last genus, different from the others in that it produces fruit that are buried by rodents, so scatter hoarding. Um, they bury them deep enough so that uh, in high intensity wildfires, it's the rodent scattered uh, seeds that were buried deep enough that actually reestablish the populations. But the question is why do they have larger seed banks? Why don't the rodents uh, more effectively consume all of that? And so it's how do they manipulate rodents? And you already know that the fruit varies in size from really small two millimeters to about 15 millimeters in diameter. And rodents should be more effective with larger fruits uh, in comparison to the other two genera that we've been seeing. Um, here's what the, the predicted results if uh, uh, you were to go and collect seed banks. If the fruit is really large, uh, the seed bank should be uh, small in density. But if the seeds are really small, uh, you should have a higher density seed bank. And this should be roughly equivalent for the total energy that you find in the soil. So basically a giving up density of rodents digging, uh, finding seed and consuming it. Okay. Something like that. This is what we actually found. So pretty much the, what the prediction is with a little more variance because the animal communities vary uh, from one place to another. So it looks like the plants and the animals are interacting pretty strongly. Um, but how are the plants manipulating the, the seed? If you've ever tried to germinate manzanitas, you may or may not realize that most of the seed are empty. About uh, 38 to 60% uh, depending upon the stand that you go to. Uh, the empty seeds increase the cost of foraging for rodents. Right? They bury a bunch together and they start picking up empty seeds. Uh, they're going to abandon uh, that little collection. Rodents are smart. I hate to say that, but they are. 
And I think another thing that man's eaters do is they variously fuse their, their nut lips, their endocarps together. So you can think of Glauca having all of them fused together, but uh, the others are almost all variously fused, and I think that increases handling time because they can't tell if there are four or five fused together, how many of them actually have a seed in it, and they've got to chew through all of them uh, to get to that seed. So here's an example. Here's all of them are happy to be free in that fruit that I opened, and all of these are fused together. But this is the more typical. The endoc endocarps are miscellaneously uh, fused together. If you were to measure, here's a proportion of viable seed and the number of fruit. So all the seeds are viable here and very few are viable there. So some fruit have very few seed in them uh, whatsoever. And that's true for lots of different species. If you look at how much uh, endocarps are fused together, uh, oops. All of them are fused here, and none are fused to the, together there. This is just one species, and so you have it all over the place. And you lay that over with the proportion of viable seed, and you start seeing that the rodents have a very confusing look. And lots of species end up that way. So the, the Archistaphylus is manipulating rodents just by providing them a lot of uh, fake seed. And they vary the degree of fusion of endocarps to confuse them about whether they're picking up something with a, a viable seed or not. And that just increases the cost of foraging and uh, gets them to abandon the cache at a, at a sooner rate. So, mass effects, all three of these, high risk for the seeders, less risk for sprouters. There's a balance between long-term accumulation and seed predation, but you can see it's a small fraction of total seed production that's actually there. Extending seed rain phenology, very small seed banks, but more than enough, and the cool one, of course, um, manipulating rodents, having a good time. Okay? You have to have wildfire. So, I, did, I want you to remember mass effects versus bet, bet, bet hedging, uh, and the huge variation within those categories. So, thank you.